Hi. In this series of videos so far, we've been talking about building a Rasa assistant. We've discussed configuration files, machine learning, uh, custom actions and forms, but what we've not talked about is how to actually get your assistant to talk to end users. You might, after all, have users on the website that you would like to offer a chat widget. Then again, you might instead want to communicate with users on their mobile phones, and you might be interested in using apps like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger. It doesn't stop there though. Uh, you might be interested in having your assistant run over Telegram, maybe over Slack, or maybe over text messages by using the Twilio API. In this video, we're going to talk about the larger Rasa architecture and how you can have Rasa communicate to the outside world on these different channels. We're also going to demonstrate how to get a Rasa assistant working on a demo website. Before showing you how to do this, it's better to take a step back though and to look at the bigger picture. So let's talk about the different parts of the Rasa architecture. In the core, we've got our NLU pipeline that predicts entities and intents. There's also our dialogue policies that predict the next action in the conversation. These two components communicate with a agent. The job of the agent is to communicate with different components and make sure that they interact properly. The architecture diagram of Rasa is a fair bit bigger though than just these Rasa open source elements. If an agent wants to handle the next action, for example, it might need a custom action in order to reply. The agent can communicate actions to the action server, which in turn can send events back. On our laptop so far, we've been running Rasa open source and custom actions as separate processes, but in a production setting, you would typically run both of these services in a separate Docker container. Having said that, there's more parts to a Rasa assistant. The agent also needs information in a pre-trained model. A pre-trained model contains our NLU and dialogue models, but also our domain.yaml file with all of our responses. This information is typically loaded from disk on startup, but we should acknowledge that it needs to be available up front. The Rasa model can also train new models if we wanted to, which is why the arrow points both ways here. In many situations, the model will just be saved on disk, but in production, Rasa can also be configured to save the model on a storage service in the cloud like S3. There's also two stores that we need in order to keep track of a conversation. The first one is the lock store. Rasa uses a ticket lock mechanism to ensure that incoming messages for a given conversation ID are processed in the right order. And it also locks conversations while messages are actively being processed. This means that multiple Rasa servers could be run in parallel as replicated services and clients don't necessarily need to address the same node when sending messages for a given conversation ID. When you're running this on your laptop, we're using an in-memory lock store, but in production, this would typically be handled by a Redis store. Besides the lock store, we will also need to have a tracker store. And the idea is that this is where the assistant's conversations will be stored. When you're running locally, an in-memory store will be used, but in a production setting, you would use a database to keep track of the entire conversation with all of your users so far. Raza allows you to use Postgres, Redis, MongoDB, and DynamoDB, but you're also free to write your own connector if you prefer to use any other database. Now, finally, we get to talk about our input-output channels. The agent communicates with this input-output component that allows us to communicate with many different channels. So far, we've been talking to it via the Rasa shell command, but if you've paid attention to the logs, you will have noticed that whenever we run Rasa shell, that a web service starts up. The shell doesn't interact with our agent directly. Instead, it communicates over HTTP. And the idea is that if the shell can communicate over HTTP, we can also use other services to connect via the same method. Looking at our architecture diagram now, I hope it's clear that if we want to have our assistant communicate with users on different platforms, that we need to focus on the input-output channel part of this diagram. What's nice here is that we can have multiple input-output channels all communicating with the same agent. That way, you have the same agent on Slack as you would have on the website, for example. 
the channel is in that sense independent of the rest of the Raza stack. Now, out of the box, Raza comes with support for Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Telegram, Twilio, and Slack. If you'd like to use any of these platforms, you will need to configure the credentials.yaml file so that you can communicate with the messaging provider. Each messaging provider tends to require slightly different credentials, but these credentials are passed in the credentials.yaml file. If you'd like to have more information, the Raza docs have guides for each channel, but the channel that we will focus on in this video uses the REST channel. And this is a channel that doesn't require any configuration and it will enable us to build a custom front end on top of Raza. The idea here is that we're going to connect a chat room widget in the browser to Raza via a REST API. And you can do that by calling the Raza run command and enabling the API via a flag. Now, before building a website with a chat widget, I would like to explore this API in more detail. I will locally run the Raza run command with the enable API flag. And this way I should be able to explore the API by communicating with it via a JSON web client. So let's explore a little bit here. So what I've got here is the standard Raza init demo project. And what I'm about to do is I'm about to run Raza with the API enabled from the command line. There's a model that has already been trained. So Raza should have everything it needs to start up and get running. So the Raza server seems to be up and running and it's hosted on localhost port 5005. So one thing that I could now do is I could go to localhost 5005 slash version to get the version information about my running instance. And it seems like I'm running Raza version 2.6.2 and that the models that are compatible with this version have to be from 2.6.0 and up. So that's cool. We're able to interface and get some JSON back. But what I figured would be good to show as well is that if you go to the Raza documentation page and you go to the HTTP API over here, that you're then also able to explore the API specification as well. And here you can see all the different endpoints that are at your disposal. We can get information from the tracker if we'd like. But I think for a demo, it might be more interesting to just communicate with a model. Via the API, I can train a model. But what I can also do is parse a message using the Raza model. And if I look at the API description, it seems that if I post to the endpoint slash model slash parse, that I'm able to send it a text and a message ID in a JSON payload, and that it then should return me entities, intents, and intent rankings. So let's try doing that. What you see here is an instance of insomnia just happens to be my favorite way of sending requests. And I can say, well, let's try sending a post request to localhost 5005 slash model slash pars. And what I'll just do is I'll just say, hi there. And that'll be the text that I'm sending. This is the endpoint. This is the payload. And when I now send this, Raza responds with a bunch of information. It repeats the text that I've sent it. It's able to tell me that the intent is greet. It's able to give me the confidence for it. And it's also able to give me a full intent ranking of all the other intents that might be worth considering. There are no entities in this model, which is why the entities list here is empty. But this is an example of a Raza model that's being served, which is nice. I can also play around with this a little bit. I can say something like, I am doing great. And since this is one of the intents that's configured in the Raza init, we can confirm that we get a different intent here. So this demonstrates that indeed, we're able to communicate with Raza over HTTP. And this allows us to communicate with lots of different channels. So we just communicated with the Raza Assistant over HTTP 
by using a REST client. We could now use this as a starting point to start writing our own front-end components, but instead of doing that, I'd like to use a widget that already exists. There's a third-party component called chatroom.js, and I'd like to use that. It comes with React components, so it's pretty easy to get started with. I'm using this component mainly because it's easy to get started with, but it does deserve mentioning that this project is not officially supported by Raza. If I'm going to be using this component, however, backhand-wise, we do need to do one extra thing. If we're going to use our HTML site to communicate with our Raza service, then we should remember that our web service, our HTML site, is sending requests and that our service is likely going to be on a different origin. And that's why we need to make sure that our Raza service allows for cross-origin resource sharing. This is also known as cores. I'm going to allow it to receive requests from anywhere by setting this flag, but in production, you can also configure the endpoint to only accept requests from specific origins. What I would now like to do is give a quick demo of the setup, and I would like to show you how this interactive widget can work. We are back in Visual Studio Code, we still have our Raza project here, but I now also have this index.html file open. Inside of this HTML file, I'm using chatroom.js. Specifically, I'm loading in the style sheet over here, and I'm loading in the JavaScript over here. And the way it works is that I have to configure a host. That will be the URL where Raza will be running. And then I need to configure a welcome message as well as a container and this container will be the place where i render my chat widget the container is pointing to this div over here so once the javascript is loaded it's going to start to put all of my user interfaces here in html finally a thing not to forget is to call chatroom.openchat without it we won't have the interactive element now to demo this, I'm going to run two things. The first thing that I need to do is call Raza run with the API enabled, but also in this case, I need to make sure that my cross origin resource sharing flag is set to star. This will accept traffic from any source by the way, but just for the demo, this is the easiest way to get started. Now that the Raza service is loaded, I can now start up a small server for this index.html file. The easiest way to do that in modern Python is to just call python-m http.server and this will load a simple server that's able to host this web page. I should now be able to go to port 8000 in my web browser and when I go there I should see this chatroom.js element render. So here we are, I'm at localhost 8000, and indeed I can see a chat widget rendering. Note that this widget has been configured to start by saying, hi, I'm an assistant, how may I help you? But from here, I should be able to type and talk to my Raza assistant. So I can say, hi there, hit submit. It's asking me, hey, how are you? I could say, I am sad. And Raza init will give me a picture of a tiger to see if that cheered me up. I can say yes. And it tells me great and I can carry on. So let's wrap up this video. In this video, we've seen the overview of the Raza architecture and we've seen how different channels are able to use the same agent. We've also seen an example of an HTML page that can connect to Raza locally. The example we've shown was a simple one and there's one extra thing worth saying. If you're going to be integrating an existing service with Raza, then odds are that it might take a while to get the connection just right. And that's why I recommend running the debug flag when developing your assistant. This way, if the connection isn't aligning perfectly, you'll have information to get further along. Having said all of this, it's good to understand how the Raza architecture works but if you're really interested in running Raza in production, there might be an easier path. 
there's a tool that we've made called Raza X. And it's a tool that makes it much easier to run your assistant and to share it with users. And we'll discuss how this works and how to set it up in an upcoming video. I hope you'll stay tuned for that. Thank <music> you.